As I prepared for this morning, my brain was like a giant ball of yarn, one you might find in the bottom of a basket, knotted together, not knowing which strand went where, or even if it was a part of the original ball. Each strand of yarn in my mind felt like a new idea, a different topic, a why not talk about this? And it seemed that no matter what I did, I couldn't grasp one string long enough to create more than a few sentences. The frustration was real. I found myself feeling defeated. I should be able to do this. I literally have a degree that taught me how to do exactly this. And in my frustration that I was feeling, I spoke with a coworker who suggested I just go back to the basics, share the gospel. Honestly, I felt quite silly and humbled after they suggested this, having not thought of it myself. And I want to share something that was amazing about God, I looked past that core, wow. That's one thing we work so hard in the summer to train the camp leaders to do, share the gospel, the good news. For if there's only one thing that someone remembers after their time at camp, I hope that it is the gospel. But what does the gospel mean? It comes from a Greek word that is translated a few different ways. Some of the ways it gets translated are the word of the Lord, to declare glad tidings, peace, the faith, the unsearchable riches of Christ, and probably most commonly known, the good news. This Greek word means a message with a positive report, something to be shared publicly and with others. In the New Testament, it is used to refer to the specific message but what God has done in and through Jesus. So what is it that God has done in and through Jesus? To investigate this, we will first be headed to the Gospel of John. This is one of the four Gospel books, um, books that write about Jesus' life, the good news of the Messiah who came and how he lived. So these books are called the Gospels because they declare good news. The Messiah, the Savior, he has come and done just what God had promised he would do. All right, so the Gospel of John, uh, we will be starting right at the beginning of chapter 1, very beginning of the book, verse 1, all the way through 18. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They were born, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. John testified about him when he shouted to the crowds, This is the one I was talking about when I said, Someone is coming after me who is far greater than I, for he existed long before me. From his abundance we have all received one gracious blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the unique one who is himself God is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. So, what do we learn from this passage? A tool we use during, during, in the summer with the team that comes at, to work at camp is to ask two questions whenever we're studying a passage. The first one is, what do I learn about Christ from this passage? And the second, what do I learn about who I am to be in Christ from this passage? So let's take a look at what we've got here. In the passage we just read, it starts off talking about the word. The W is capitalized, meaning it's a proper noun and a name. So as we read further, we learn about who this word is. So the word brought life and light to everyone. The word shines in the darkness and can't be extinguished by it. The word is the true light. The word became human and made his home among us. The word is full of unfailing love and faithfulness. The word is the one and only son of the father. 
and the word is near the father's heart. Is it sounding like anyone? Any guesses as to who the word might be? In verse 17, we get a clear statement that the word is Jesus. So we take what we learned in 17 and apply what we know of the word to Jesus, or answering that first question, what do we learn about Christ in this passage? We learn that Jesus is the true light, bringing life and light to everyone, shining light into the darkness. He became human and made his home among us. Jesus is full of unfailing love and faithfulness. He is the one and only son of the Father and is near to the Father's heart. What else do we learn here in this passage? Well, we learn that Jesus, the word, is God, was God, and has always existed. We also learn he came to the world he had created, but the world didn't recognize him. Even his own people, the ones who've been waiting and longing for him to come, rejected him. But the following part of the passage helps us answer the second question of, what do I learn about whom I am to be in Christ from this passage? We read that those who believed and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. That those who believe are reborn, not in a physical birth from human works, but a birth that comes from God. That in believing in Jesus, we have received one gracious blessing after another. Grace is God's free and unmerited favor, something we can't earn or prove ourselves worthy of. We're going to continue our exploration of what the gospel is by heading a few chapters farther into John, to chapter 3. So here we are at John 3, 16, 17. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. When we take what we learned from the previous passage and look here, what do we see? We see that when we believe in Christ, we not only become children of God, but have eternal life. We become reborn in a spiritual way. We learn that though the world rejected Jesus, he did not come to judge, but to save. Once again, answering those two questions that we talked about before, what else can we learn? Well, what can we learn about Christ from this passage? We learn that Christ humbled himself to save us, that we might have a relationship with God again. What about the second question? What do we learn about who we are to be in Christ from this passage? We learn that all we need to do is believe, to have faith. It doesn't say so that everyone who believes and turns around six times. No, it says simply everyone who believes. It is Christ who has done the work. It is Christ who has paid the price. I'm sure for many of us, this is a passage we hear often, especially in discussion with the gospel. But how often do we really dwell on what it is saying? For this is how God loved the world. This is speaking to all of us, who we are, uh, those of us who were and are, and those who are to come. And honestly, humans aren't the best bunch you could imagine. If we take a gander through a history book, we see the brokenness and wickedness of humans. Or if we take a scroll through our social medias, it shows up there. Even the Bible doesn't hide how far we have fallen. But God loved us. So much so, he sent his son so that we didn't have to stay in this state of brokenness. He didn't send him to judge us, but to save us. Isn't that just so good? Such encouraging news. And that is the gospel. It gets restated over and over as we read through the Bible, as we read through the New Testament. And Romans 5 reiterates this exactly to us. Therefore, since we've been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us, because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. 
but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we've been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, since we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. Because of Christ's actions on our behalf, we have a right relationship with God. Nothing we did brought us this, and nothing we do can make us worth being in front of a holy God. But God in his grace and love stepped out on our behalf. The gospel, the good news, the message that though we were in a broken relationship with God and could do nothing to ever mend it again, he made a way. Sending his son, Jesus, who acted as a pure sacrifice on our behalf. And now, Christ's blood has washed us clean, allowing us access to the Father. If we truly know and understand the gospel, we understand that God is loving, that he is gracious, that he wants relationship with us. Doesn't that just go against the narratives in our head? That if we've done something wrong or if it's getting painful in our life, I must have messed up. Or if I do something I think that God doesn't want me to do, I need to wait in fear of punishment. We struggle to grasp the gospel. It doesn't stick very well. Perhaps this is why a mentor of mine once said, we need to hear the, we we can never hear the gospel enough. We should be telling it to ourselves daily and to each other every day. The good news, the gospel, is as true today as it was in the New Testament, as it was in the Old Testament. God has woven his love and work to redeem his children back to him all through history and is doing it now as well. We can easily get bogged down by the stress of what is happening around us. Or even when we go to study the Bible, become overwhelmed by people's opinions and different theologies. But what if we kept it simple? Stepped back to the basics, kept the main thing, the main thing, the gospel. The truth that we are loved by an everlasting God who paid a great price to bring me and you back to relationship with him. If we could keep this as the one thing we remember, how might our life be different? And how might our hearts be changed?